In this video, I'm going to be attempting to recreate the core mechanics of the popular mobile game Survivor.io in Godot 4.0. So grab a snack, sit back and enjoy the development process. The other day, I opened up the App Store to see what kinds of games were trending in the mobile game market. At the very top, I saw this game called Survivor.io. As soon as I saw this, vague memories of being bombarded by this game's ads on YouTube bubbled up in my mind. I went ahead and downloaded the game to see what it was all about. After playing the game for a good few rounds, I thought to myself that it might be a great exercise to try to recreate this game in Godot. After all, the core mechanics seem simple enough to the point where a beginner developer like myself might be able to replicate it. Before jumping into the development bit, I want you to keep in mind that this is only my third proper project in Godot, and I have had zero experience with Godot 4.0. On top of that, I did not learn Godot through proper video tutorials or courses, but through the documentation. I wanted to bring this up because the code I've written for this project is the best spaghetti in the world, the design practices I've followed are questionable, and the end product is held together by duct tape and glue. So, any and every suggestion on improving any aspect of the development process would be greatly appreciated. Enough said, let's jump into it. The first thing I wanted to plan out before getting started is a list of core systems that I would have to implement. I narrowed those down to the following three. The player, the enemy, and the weapons. After that, I fired up the brand new Godot 4.0, created a new project, and got to work implementing the player. The movement system was a basic 8 directional movement which did not take me much time to implement, especially because there is a whole page in the documentation which explains how to do it. After successfully making the player move, I moved on to the enemy. Making the enemy follow the player was not too difficult, so the next step was to make the enemies mortal. After successfully implementing mortality, I mirrored the same system for the player but with a larger health pool. I made it so that the player would take damage when it is colliding with a zombie. Now that the player is vulnerable, the next logical step was to create a way for the player to damage the zombies. Since I'd run out of distinct placeholder items, I went ahead and drew the first weapon of the game, a kunai, in Krita. While trying to implement the functionality of the kunai, I stumbled upon an interesting problem. I could not get the look at function in Godot to work the way I wanted it to. The kunais after being thrown were facing the opposite direction of where they should have been facing. I'm sure it had to do with the node's pivot and whatnot, but I simply didn't have the time to dive into the guts of the function. So I just experimented around and ended up finding the solution, which was to flip the kunai sprite horizontally so that it behaved the way I wanted it to. At this point, the game was becoming unplayable without a camera that followed the player, so that's what I implemented next. I'm not sure if this problem is unique to me, but while trying to offset the camera, the bounds of it kept disappearing when zooming in and out, which made it harder for me to determine where they actually were. You might have noticed a problem here with our prototype at the moment. Even though the camera is following the player, it is hard to tell that the player is in motion because it is moving against a uniform grey background. So that's what I worked on next. After quickly realizing that I didn't have the time nor the skill to recreate the background in the original game, I settled for a grid which also does the job of serving as a stationary point to contrast the player's motion against. After having stared long enough at a bunch of hot pink rectangles, I could not take it any longer, and decided to create a proper sprite for the zombies. Setting the canvas size to 300 by 300 was a mistake, as it was in the realm of pixel art, which was not what I was aiming for. So I restarted with a 1080 by 1080 canvas and drew the zombie to the best of my limited ability from memory. Since I didn't have time to implement animation, I thought that simply flipping the zombie sprite to make it face the direction where it is heading would furnish its lifeless existence with some life. I originally wanted it to be so that the background would spawn in wherever the player went, thus I tried to build a chunk system where upon the player nearing the edge of a chunk, another chunk would spawn adjacent to it thus giving the illusion of an infinite world. But for the life of me I could not figure out how to get collisions to work between an area 2D and a character body 2D. I tested each component individually, but to no avail. It was only much later that I realized what the problem was. I had toggled off the console output so all my tests that were potentially yielding results were considered by me to be failures because I could not see the output. But I did not know this at the time, so I had to scrap the whole idea of chunks. That fruitless venture ended up wasting a huge chunk of my time. 
Having moved on, I now wanted to focus on creating an enemy spawner which would spawn the zombies randomly around the player and would gradually ramp up the difficulty of the game by incrementing the spawn rate. Next, I worked on implementing gems which would be the collectibles dropped by the zombies upon their death that would allow the player to level up. After having done that, I felt as if the player should have more agency over the kunai throws because at the moment, the kunai would be thrown at a random zombie, hence I made it so that the kunai is thrown to the closest zombie to the player, so now the player's movement actually matters because it determines which zombie is targeted by his kunai. I finally felt like I reached the point where I could add additional weapons. To limit the scope of this project, I wanted to implement only two other weapons from the original game, the force field and the rocket. For the force field, after I created the sprite for it, I wrote a little shader that would fade out the sprite based upon its distance from the center, thus creating a radial transparency gradient. I could have drawn the transparency into the sprite to begin with, but I wanted to build some familiarity with shaders, so this was my first foray into shader coding. After unsuccessfully trying to make the force field blink through the shader, I moved on to creating the final weapon of the game. The rocket. Since I was familiar with the move and collide function of the character body 2D, I was trying to shoehorn the rocket into being one when in fact an area 2D would have been sufficient for its purposes. After struggling for what felt like an hour, I decided to take a break as I had been working on this game continuously for too long. At this point, I was exhausted, tilted, and hopeless. It was Thursday evening and the game was not looking anywhere close to being finalized. On top of that, the rocket was giving me much problems to implement and I just could not see a way out. I considered quitting and postponing the development and thus the video to another week. But thankfully after the break, I was reinvigorated and ready to see this project to completion. The first thing I did upon return was to delete the old rocket scene and script and start afresh. This time, I made it an area 2D, which I should have done from the start but was unable to due to the fear of the unknown. Moreover, I improved my workflow significantly and started testing each individual unit of the script I wrote before linking it to the whole project. Godot's brilliant scene system lends itself perfectly for this kind of modular approach. Having finished making all the weapons, I now started finishing up the whole project by implementing the different UI systems, namely an upgrade select panel, a health bar, and a label that tells you how many points you have and how many you need to level up. Even though I basically had no experience with making UI in Godot, I was surprised by how easy the UI knows where to work with. In particular, the health bar was extremely easy to implement with Godot's progress bar node. After the UI was done, the project was officially completed. The first thing I did after completing this project was to make a git commit. You know things must have taken a left turn somewhere when your git log shows two commits. One that says that the project was created, and the other that says that it was completed. After about 10 hours of labor, this is what the final product looks like. It's more of a prototype than a replica of the original, but being a beginner, I'm quite happy with what I was able to achieve. I hope you found this video entertaining. I'll end with the following quote. If everyone thinks that they can do the undoable, the world will be in trouble. If no one thinks that they can do the undoable, the world will be in trouble. This has been Cupid. I'll see you in the next one.